which people assume is Rome. But careful looking at the, uh, the Greek, it doesn't mean seven hills, but seven larger bodies of land. And people have come to see that that means continent. Ah, I didn't know that. It was um, it was eighty something degrees this afternoon in Germany, and in the middle of nowhere, it started hailing. Really? Oh, wow! Yeah, and then um, and then uh, they had a huge, like extremely loud uh, thunder the other night. Uh, Max actually had sent me a video. Uh, if you guys want to hear it, it was I had the video. I'd be more than happy to send it to you guys. It's really 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 scary it woke him up wow yeah that's usually what creates the big hail is those big thunderstorms that go up to 50 60,000 feet wow. anyway mark i got lost there for a minute don't get lost don't be lost <laughs> um there's um people that have an understanding kind of like what ellen g white talks about the United States is uh, actually mentioned in the Bible many times. In fact, uh, one claim is that there's 53 mentions in the Bible, and, one, and this is one of them, the seven so-called hills. That was a mistaken uh, interpretation. It really could be in seven continents. There's only uh, one power in the world that has exercises power. That means sits on seven hills, exercises power on seven continents. That's the oh, really? States. That's oh. one of the that's one of the indicators that they're talking about the United States, the Babylon of our time. Ah, okay. Good information. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. We are uh, just excited that you've joined us for our uh, Friday night Bible study, and we have a really good program planned tonight. So. Sit back and don't just enjoy it because you're going to participate here in just a few minutes. So uh, we're going to start off with Ina. She's going to have our opening prayer and then Mike is going to lead our discussion. So I'm going to turn the time over to Ina at this time. Hi, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I'm so sorry. I'm driving. Unfortunately, I can't close my eyes, but let's go. <laughs> that will be very dangerous if I do that, but let's go ahead and uh, close your eyes, except me, for prayers. Dear Father in heaven, we are extremely, extremely, I am seriously, extremely grateful for this wonderful evening with my brothers and my sisters celebrating your day. Thank you, Father, for bringing us, all of us, our families and our friends into our home safely and sound for this beautiful evening. Please bless us and keep us safe and open our hearts and open our minds that we may learn how to understand your words deeply and practice them. And not only practice practice them, but walk on walk on our on our um uh, walk on those uh, those promises and those lessons that we are going to be discussing this evening. We thank you once again for uh, for this beautiful evening, and we ask you, Lord, to please forgive us to all of our sins and all of our shortcomings. Thank you for um, for listening to our prayers. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So I'll start discussion. So there's this, um, this business person, entrepreneur slash investor guy who always asks his employees if someone wants to get a job with him, he asks them, what is it that you know that not many people would agree with you on? Or what, what is it that you believe that not many people agree with you on? And I just think that's an interesting question. And I don't know exactly why he asked that or what he what he expects to hear um, that makes him decide whether or not they're worthy of being hired. But I just want to ask you today, what is it that you believe that reassure that reaffirms your faith that may be or what is it maybe about your religion or your belief that you think is unique, something that you can't find anywhere else and that reassures you or reaffirms your faith in in your faith or what you believe in? It could be Seventh-day Adventist, it could be just Christian, it could be anything that 
that you think is that you can't find anywhere else. And I think something unique about Seventh Day Adventist is, well, the love of Christ this is a Christian thing, but I think um, I think just the understanding of the Bible. Um, but when I heard the Rev, what what I heard uh, the Seventh Day Adventist interpretation of Revelation is something that I haven't heard anywhere else, and I think that it it kind of opened up the rest of the Bible for me and made me realize that God knows the beginning from the end and that he's, he's one of our young adult uh, leaders. And um, he lives in the city. Uh-huh. Okay. I am so sorry, Mike. I hit mute on everybody <laughs> and I got you too. So I am so sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. So, yeah, I think um, when I think about that, when I think about the role of Sabbath and Sunday and the end time events is something that reaffirms my faith and um, makes me want to pray more and come back to God when I'm, you know, have doubts. So, so we're talking about what we believe or what, something that we think is unique about our faith and something that maybe some people outside of our faith that don't agree with us, what we believe that that reaffirms our faith and that brings us back to um, believing. So I'm going to choose Veronica. It doesn't have to be strictly unique to Seventh-day Adventist, but just in your personal life, what brings you back to, to believing in God or being faithful? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking more in terms, like you were saying, like not other people might know or, or believe in, and a lot of it is like keeping the Sabbath. Like, you know, even like Christian friends, when you tell them about the Sabbath, they always wonder like, why? And, you know, it's something that's in the Bible, so give me that reassurance of um, that it's something that God uh, did and he asked us to do. Um, and, you know, it's like, I guess, hard for a lot of other Christians to understand it uh, because of the changes that were done through the history. But um, we have the Bible that talks about it. And um, it's good that we uh, follow what God is saying there. Um, okay, let me call somebody else. Uh, what about Star? Hard for me to say. Um, I've had so many interesting things happen to me because of God that I, I can't really talk to anybody about. Uh, so I, I definitely believe in him and, and you know, total, total faith in him. But, but those events were so unearth-like. I mean, they were definitely different and I really can't go into it. But yeah, it, it definitely... Uh, my faith like a hundred percent what about joanne that's me hello everyone happy sabbath so i'm a um i've I've been connected to God ever since i i remember there's this that spirituality that's been inculcated in my mind and in my heart by my parents but we we are sunday worshipers i grew up in a catholic uh household and then eventually became uh, a baptist up until now my mom is i am a uh pastor's daughter actually um and and, and in the philippines i was a uh, youth pastor i actually have the authority to marry people something like that uh but all my life it's been i've been connected to the ministry and doing um god's word but the unique thing about my relationship with god now is the observance of sabbath um it's just the long week like monday to friday you work 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 and then boom sabbath you just stop it's like i feel like you're screeching halt and just Sabbath rest. I appreciated it more because after that five days of just work, 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 then you have that sudden change of mindset. 
practice Sabbath, rest, unplug. No TV, no nothing, just just God. And that's something that uh, actually has deepened my walk with God. And then, of course, there's Sunday, and then one more day before you start another another week. I I truly look forward to f- Sabbath, Friday, Saturday. Um, and as I walk, I continue to appreciate the value, not just resting my mind, my body, but just setting aside an honest to goodnessly day, time, hour, just to be with God. So thank you. I am choosing Esther. Thank you. Um, I think what's really unique and different about our denomination is that we believe in the state of the dead and that um, when people die, they're sleeping. And to me, that is very different from the majority of what Christians believe in. Um, But I think it's very um, reassuring to me and it gives me a lot of hope um, that we, we have the resurrection to look forward to and that our loved ones are sleeping in Jesus and just waiting for his second coming. So to me, that brings a lot of hope and assurance. Okay, I will pick MJ. Hi, uh, um, happy Sabbath. Thank you, Esther. Uh, Can you guys hear me? I think I I unmuted. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, wow. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I got the question right, uh, Mike and Esther, but uh, Mike, you're mentioning that. uh, Would you be so kind to repeat the question, though, Mike or Esther? Yeah, so the question is just something that is unique about what you believe that you think other people might not agree with you with. Uh, maybe other people in your life and why that reassures you and yeah reassures your faith and why you why it brings you closer to God okay thank you Mike and thank you um, Esther that's a really excellent question Um, and this is going to be a touchy subject but I don't think it will be amongst our brothers and sisters here as you all know there was overturning of Roe versus Wade early this morning and um, for the, the ones that don't know our YouTube land that's a very serious um, overturning where it's, we have the pro-choicers, where the women of this era, and, and I think since 1973 or so, there were women believing, you know, I, I have the right to do with my body what I want to do. Um, that was a, a different era, um, well, compared to the conservative times of the 40s, 50s, and then now, wow, to the pro-lifers. And when I was younger, I too was along that, not on the fence, I was pro-choice, but how wrong, how fundamentally wrong that is, where we can easily think of the rights, and granted, I love pets, granted, I love animals, then we come so quickly to save the animals, yet when it comes to our unborn, a woman who, I don't know if they've been intimate prior to marriage or after the fact, but to callously, you know, let, they call it a DNC, um, to callously slice away at a, an unborn child, the fetal heartbeat, you know, I don't even, from the moment of conception, that is life. I, I don't see how my belief back then was, oh, yeah, I want my body, I'll do with it what I want. But now knowing, especially having um, two children, and one of them being special needs, who during that era could have easily been, easily been aborted. And both of them are such blessings from God. So no, I do not believe in pro-choice. I am definitely pro-life. I could never think of murdering my children. I don't know how anybody conceive, can conceive that, that that is okay, because that is most definitely against God's commandment. He definitely says, thou shall not kill. Um, but thank you. And you guys, I can't see. So Esther, um, feel free to choose on. A happy Sabbath, everybody. Great question, Mike. Okay. Um, I will pick on Bill. It's, it looks like he's raising his hand. So I will pick on Bill. 
Well, thank you. I wasn't raising my hand, but it's interesting that that's how you perceive that move. <laughs> um, I, th I think we're all called, we're all called to God by the Holy Spirit and we're all called to the, to the light that draws us at a certain time that, that, we, that we reflect, that we, we're attracted to. And I know I've been at many different churches, but when I was much older and uh, I finally yielded to God's invitation, not a very graceful, not a very graceful uh, yielding, but yielding nonetheless. Um, he attracted me to the to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and I liked it for what many people are saying: the uh, the beliefs, the, the I think the devoutness of the founders. You know, back 150 years ago, Helen Ellen White. Um, and, and so I, I think that's all, I, I feel very uh, blessed to be a Seventh-day Adventist because um, I, I think that we've, we're, um, we practice more of a uh, logical following of the Bible, you know, that, yeah. But I think it's about change, you know, how it, how it affects you. You can have the best doctrine, you can have the best philosophy, the best anything, but does it change your heart? And so probably the thing that was most instrumental in my life was asking the Holy Spirit into it. And was I ever surprised when he came and has been a, a guest on and off in my life? I think you have to keep asking him. And he, 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 he makes the Bible alive. I've learned more about the Bible in these, in these years that I've been, I guess, a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, born-again Christian um, than I ever learned in, in 60 years, sort of, uh, you know, uh, studying it in a secular fashion. It, it just makes the words, it's spirit calling the spirit. And, and what I see in Seventh-day Adventism is, is most of you, more than uh, not, I think, you, you're all engage in that same effort along those same path of being, you know, a relationship with Christ and a relationship with each other. And Mark is a, is a good um, uh, teacher and pastor, and he practices what he, he preaches and rolled in. And uh, I, I don't know. And I didn't like this church when I came here. I, I had asked the Holy Spirit to, to show me a remnant, a seed remnant church. But he showed me the church I needed to to be in to um, to test my 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 path and and I've since come to really uh, enjoy and appreciate you all and uh, uh, anyway so that's I don't know I'm just gonna trail off and find somebody else to pick up the ball here but thanks for asking and who yeah. else is there let's see. Oh, I know. Da, 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 da. I was like, oh, there's Patricia. I like to generally hear from Patricia at least once a night. Uh, Mark's teacher and guide. <laughs> uh, I like talking to you, Bill. Um, I think for me, if I was to choose one subject, it would be the Sabbath. Uh, I have to admit, I wasn't a great Sabbath keeper for a while. Uh, even though I was um, raised to, in a Seventh-day Adventist home, um, there were times that I didn't keep the Sabbath very well. And it wasn't until I decided you have to be really serious about what you believe in. It's not just your parents' religion. What do you believe in? And the crux of it was the Sabbath for me because I realized that the whole point of keeping the Sabbath is a personal relationship with God. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it's only in the Fourth Commandment you find out who this God is that's speaking to you. It's not one of these Egyptian gods or a man-made God, but it's the Creator God. It's a God who made heaven and earth, 
and all that in them is and um and asked us to work six days but the seventh day would be to rest and to get to know him better so uh that actually made the difference for me and still makes a difference for me because it reminds me of who he is and because he asks us to keep the sabbath i realize that's good enough that's more than good enough to keep the sabbath uh and you know it's not just about keeping the sabbath i think during divine worship hours but pretty much the whole day um is it makes you reflect upon what he's done for us so Thank you for asking me, and I'm going to let uh, Esther choose someone for me. Okay, um, I will pick Livia. Ever wonder what the Sabbath was like before it was codified in Exodus 20? Just a question. I think it was really awesome. I mean, we had it from Genesis chapter 2. From the very beginning, when he walked with Adam and Eve, and even before then. So to answer Mike's question, um, the flood for me, <clears throat> I see I see the flood everywhere I look. Evidence of the flood everywhere. I, global flood, global worldwide flood, everywhere I look. Um, features. Um, if you see any, any topology from Utah, I drove from, um, I flew to uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and drove through Wyoming and, and Utah, all the way to Seattle. And <clears throat> it's just amazing uh, the impression that I, that I get from looking at the topology, and I just see the flood all over the place. So that's it for me. Not too many people believe in a worldwide flood. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you could actually see evidence of it in Google Maps. If you go to pull all the way out to where you see the globe, you can see the rolling of the mud through the through the like South America and the way it's rolled around. It's amazing. It's amazing when you when you know about mud flows and things like that. It's just incredible. Um, how about um, Alice? You're, mu you're muted, Alice. What's the question? The question is what- I what, just came. Okay. The question is what is unique about your belief, about what you believe? What do you think is unique about that that some people might disagree with, but that reassures your faith and strengthens it? This is hard. Um, I don't know what to believe. I mean, uh, that's okay. You can pass. always pass. Yeah, you can pass. Yeah. Pass. All right. I'm going to ask Pastor Roll Dan, the last person. Okay. Oh, thank you. For choosing me, <laughs> uh, one of the beliefs that is unique that we have as a Seventh Day Adventist is the state of the dead, and there's a lot of people who don't believe in that that there were going to be a resurrection morning, and a lot of people believe that uh, when they die, uh, they were going to go to heaven if they were good people, if they were bad, they will go to hell or in the purgatory. If you are in the middle, you're not really good and you're not really bad. But there are some people believe also that they were going to be in the spirit world. But I'm so grateful that um, there were going to be a resurrection morning that someday somehow you will see your mother, father that passed away, especially my daughter or my, my, my sister. And for me, when I was a kid, I really scared of cemetery. I live in very close in the cemetery. And whenever I passed by the cemetery, I was so afraid because it seems that somebody were gonna be poke me at the back 
or some some ghost will gonna be uh, poke me at the back of the head or in the butt. But you know, when I read the Bible and I uh, realized that the Bible tells us that there will gonna be a resurrection of the dead, that there will gonna come a time that those people who die and they have Jesus in their lives, they will gonna be resurrected again and they will live again. Cemetery is not a it is not a scary place for me. When Jesus comes, cemetery is the place for me. It's a beautiful place. It's a happy place because that will gonna be the place where people who have Jesus, they will be resurrected in that in that place. They will meet all those people who love each other. You will see those people that you love. So this is a great promise for me. And although there's a lot of people who don't believe in this, but whenever, you know, in my own personal experience, when I give Bible studies about the state of the dead, most of the people, in fact, I can say 95% of those people that I gave Bible study about the state of the dead, they really accepted it and they really believe in it. And I'm so grateful that we have a promise like this in the Bible. And yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Roland. What's up? Uh, can you choose for me, Mike? Yeah. Thank you. I think I think we'll move on. Actually. So thank you for everyone that that gave us your um, that reminded us what what you what you believe in, why you believe in it, and why it strengthens your faith. Um, I really appreciate Bill Bill talking about the Holy Spirit. I've been reading about the Holy Spirit a lot and inviting God into your life really changes everything. And everything that we believe always comes back to Jesus, as Mark was saying earlier, to simplify it all. Jesus loves me, this I know, that's the core of our faith. And it helps us, opens up the scripture. And hopefully it's something that we all come back to and just to worship God and um, believe in him. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate all your thoughts and being here. And I hope that you're blessed tonight. So I'm going to pass to Veronica to play music. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our first song for tonight, I was thinking of a song that, you know, maybe you know, we listen when we were um, younger or we uh, have heard the kids uh, play or like we play for the kids. And we were actually also talking about this at the beginning of our meeting um, with Pastor Mark, like Ma Mike was saying, and um, we, uh, Pastor Mark was saying that uh, one time somebody asked, uh, what is something that can describe uh, something about God or like what we believe and in a simple way? And this song uh, describes a lot in a simple way, uh, how Jesus loves us and what he has done for us. Um, Pastor Mark, can you stay play this song or not? I saw that you were not on camera. Oh, yeah, you're there. All right. Can you help us play in the song, please? Sure, I'll be happy to. I'm just gonna mute everybody so you can have a good listening experience. And we will start the song now.
All right, thank you so much, Veronica, for picking that beautiful song for us. And uh, I know that we have several prayer requests, and you have prayer requests. If you would like to put those in the chat, then um, Esther can pray over those at the end of our uh, Bible study tonight. Um, but tonight, our Bible study is going to be about uh, uh, a demoniac. It is a rather unique miracle and uh joan is going to be presenting it and uh, as you know we're going through the books of the gospels looking at the different miracles so joan uh thank you so much for leading out tonight and we'll let you start and then everybody else we have time for you to participate so don't be so quick to hit that mute button we want you to be able to participate because we're going to learn from everybody tonight so joan i'll turn it over to you Thank you very much, Pastor Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, to my American English speaking friends, my name is Joan. To my Filipino family, mga kapatid, Joan po, pautang mamaya. Um, I, I, I wanted to start our um, study tonight with uh with a short prayer would you please bow your heads with me dear heavenly father we offer this time to you thank you for allowing us to thank you for giving us this gift of sabbath and also this time to study be with us oh god and be with our conversation anoint us bless us this is our prayer in jesus name amen we i wanted to can I share? Sharing my screen. Our, oh. Our lesson uh, tonight, um, what we wanted to, stu to study tonight is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. Three, actually, 32. It's verse 32, not 33. Um, but I wanted to start the, to start and just create the background of the story itself by <gasps> reading a couple of verses um, up. And that is starting from the 15th, Matthew chapter 12 verse 15 and it says aware of this Jesus withdrew from the place a large crowd followed him and he healed all those who were ill he warned them not to tell others about him it was he was so this was so to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah here is my servant whom I have chosen the one I love in whom I delight I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to all to the nations and he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through the victory uh, through to victory 
In his names, nation will put their hope. Verse 22, then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that, so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demon, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? If I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do, you, do your people drive, out, drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God it's himself has come. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first tries to ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder the house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. So I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but Blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either this age or in the age to come. Wow. Wow. How do you respond to someone who hates you? With, with a passion. I, I remember uh, this one lady from um, Burlingame Church. I just finished my vacation Bible school. Man, it was very, very packed vacation Bible school. We planned for 40 students coming in, 50 came. Um, I have materials for 50. It was it was a lot of work. I had to do fundraising, present to the board why we wanted this. It was it was it was a lot of planning. I took two weeks off from work to do that. It was very successful because a lot of young people participated. They were my teachers, a lot of you know, um church goers, church members who were not necessarily active. Uh, helped out is you know being with kids makes a lot of people comfortable it was very successful and then this lady comes to me and say you know in front of the during potluck just after service during potluck on the top of top of her voice and she said you know you don't have the holy spirit in you my mind at that time it just went to the this mode like oh, just like she's just slow motion. I can't remember what she says. I can't hear what she says when she said the Holy Spirit is not with you. It went to this mechanism mode, coping mode, and she probably I can it's just slow motion. She was so mad. I can see her face. I remember my husband standing up and screaming at him at her too. And he was like, Ooh, I can't, I can't remember anything. But she was so mad at me. There's nothing I can do that would make her happy. Either my lipstick is too red. My skirt is too short. It's too long. Nothing. You know what I did? I did what every human in their right mind would do. I Googled her. I researched her. I know where she worked. I know which office she works. I called her office. Boy, I was so mad. I was ready for a revenge. Deep down in our core, there is this wanting, this need to be, to, to get even, to fight back. I didn't do anything. Time passed. She eventually moved to 
I think Sacramento. And um, I don't know, she is, I don't know what happened, but um, we've separated path. But I do know how it is to receive so much hatred. When I, I used to work in, I, I used to work in a company where I received phone calls and one person uh, call, I called, I mispronounced his name. And she, he said, you know, you're, you're not from here. You're, you're apple pickers. Your parents are apple pickers. You're, you're, you came here from both. And you're, and I just, after that, I just, I'm putting the phone down. Uh, I, I know, I know, hate you, you being re receiving hate, your hands get cold and you just want to do something to get even. That very same feeling, put it back, put it, bring it to Matthew 12, where Jesus was in the middle of his ministry. This was Jesus were performing a lot of miracles already. People, he was starting to get a lot of followers. There's a name buzz about him. His um, becoming a very famous influencer at that time to use the millennial word. Um, he has done nothing wrong. Um, he said all the right words. He responded correctly to questions. In fact, he cared, only cared for people around him. But he was being followed by people who is determined to make his life miserable. I can't see my, I can't see my uh, slide. We can see it. You can see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So he is being followed by people who wants to make his life miserable. Follow not to listen, not to hear, not to learn, but follow just to pick errors in everything he does. Before I continue, I wanted to take this time to actually stop. We as Adventists, we as Christians, has a very strong risk or tendency to be, to be this. Because we grew up, we are always uh, studying the Bible. We get deeper and deeper to, to, to the word of God. We sometimes lose track on what is truly is essential. And we become, we have that tendency to become legalistic, just like the Pharisees. And point out what the pastor is saying or what the speaker is saying. Oh, wrong this, wrong here, this and that. Um, and so let's, let's be watchful. Let us watch and pray. So this is the Pharisees. This is what they're doing. They follow not to uh, believe and see and learn, but they follow to make Jesus' life um, miserable. Pharisees, who are they? So I know not, I do not know a lot about Paris Pharisees. So I want to open up the microphone for everyone. Pastor Kindly, um, can you tell me a word or two about Pharisees? Who are they? Where did they start? What, what are their qualities? Help. Someone. Anyone. They didn't like Jesus. They, I'm sorry? They didn't like Jesus. John, hello! Yes, they did not like Jesus. Why did they not like Jesus? Are they the ones they sold false lies? They'll be like, this, but then they'll add this and this into it, which isn't true. Which isn't true. They, okay. Sorry. They, they follow. I think Say that again. Who 
was like, are they, aren't they the ones that I just, are they the ones I just learned about that would tell you part truth, but then they would tell you a bunch of lies on the end? That could possibly be true. I think they didn't like Jesus because um, Jesus brought conviction to their lives and they didn't like that. And also Jesus made them look bad and yeah. they were all, uh, they were all about appearances looking good. Yeah. And Jesus kind of exposed them for who they were. Status quo. They're all about status quo, right? Did Jesus not... like them? Did Jesus hate them? No, did he like them? Did he like them? Did Jesus like them? Is that your question, John? Yes. I want to throw that question to everyone. Did Jesus like them? Uh. <laughs> I think Jesus liked them. They do. I, 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 think, I think because uh, Jesus did not um, hate somebody else. Mm -hmm. Jesus then, has this is a uh, I think this is always like because they don't don't believe in him right the, they make something bad with Jesus but I never I never heard about Jesus say I hate this this Pharisees Pharisees yeah I never, I never re I read or something. I never seen in the books about this one. Always is love everybody. That's it. Yeah, so yes. Jesus, Jesus called, well, the Pharisees hate them because Jesus called them, called them out, right? Jesus called them hypocrite. To the Pharisees, Pharisees' eyes, Jesus can do nothing right. Um, they follow they their Jesus. Own Go ahead. They have their own agenda. That's right. That's right. They have their own agenda. They have their own purpose. They have. They want something else. Were they uh, say Jewish people too? Can you say that again, John? Were they Jewish people? Were they Jewish people? I don't know. Yeah, they were they were Jews and they were part of the hierarchy. Many of them, these people were scribes and and uh, lawyers and the lawyers uh, of you know of the law. And I, Jesus came to save them too, but they were always trying to undermine him. And he was he kind of reflect. He would try to teach them, and they didn't want to buy it. And so then they you know they worked with other other of their type and they tried to figure out ways to kill them and it was a it was a tough situation they were involved in too because there was an occupying army in israel at the time the romans and uh, eventually as everybody knows they used the, the romans to to try to kill jesus and uh they yeah they they were a stiff-necked and stubborn bunch they didn't want to lose their power or their money or their influence that's and right. uh, Jesus kept pulling, yanking on their tails, and they didn't like it. And, you know, he, but he came to save them too. Right. You know, right. some of them, some of them paid attention. There were a few instances, and then there were the Sadducees, and uh, but there was a lot of competition and you know competing and rivalries within the hierarchy of the Jewish um, theocracy at that time, and it was all about power and money and prestige and. And uh, they had their hands full with Jesus, though, didn't they? <laughs> so, yes. So, so. so the Pharisees do follow Jesus with interest, but it's different. Uh, thank you, Bill. It is different um, with a different purpose. They're curious, curious, curiosity, followed by suspicious, grows into a suspicions, and then it grows to, to resentment. Um, so the hinge or the turning point, as you, uh, if you may, 
um, is actually in verse 14 when he said, when he said, but the Pharisees, sorry, misspelling, went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. When you start plot, plotting, uh, brothers and sisters, these is, you've thought about it, you've deliberated about it, uh, you go to a secret place, you meet someone about it, there's conspiracy to and a campaign to get rid of Jesus. So this is the turning point. They're not just merely curious. Um, they There is a plan of action. However, Jesus knew their thoughts. This, this is very interesting. You can read your mind. Yes, he can, he, he, they knew his thought. Um, in verse 14, the Pharisees, uh, um, in verse 15, it says, God knew about it. So the crowds were increasing. Uh, Pharisees were plotting against him. There were more and more followers to hear and see and experience Jesus. And at the same token, on the other side, there's Pharisees plotting, about, uh, plotting against him. And Jesus knew about it. And it's amazing what he did next. They, they knew what kind of power he had too. Yes. They knew what power he had. The Pharisees knew what power Jesus had. Yes, yes. And that's why they're intimidated. Um, and so Jesus knew about the plot. But interesting is how Jesus reacted. It said, um, our verse, the, the, the readings we, we read earlier, it said, he left the area. Um, he didn't do what I did. He didn't Google the person where the office is, what his phone, her phone number is, and plant a revenge and nothing. He didn't want to get in confrontation. Jesus knew that it was not his time, not the time yet. Instead, he walked away. He walked away. He left the area. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people who will be not happy with what we do and I want to just take this time and pause here for a little bit I heard someone say that you can never reach your destination if you keep throwing a stone of every dog that barks at you learn how to walk away so Jesus could have done multiple things right with his power oh. they, Jesus could have zapped them and they disappear um or Jesus could have told people and say, you guys take care of it. Um, and, but none of this self-serving or gaining sympathy about him or being a victim, none of that happened. Jesus simply walked away. Jesus simply walked away. That's I what think I that's would do. Very, very, such control of Emotion. Jesus at that time probably was angry. I don't know what he's feeling at that time. But to walk away, man, that's that's something. Um, he kept saying to tell others uh, not to reveal who he was because he knew that it was not his time yet. Then out of the blue, there's this demonized man, a man that appears before God. I just my heart just goes out with this guy when I'm studying him. He is the most pitiful man ever I've seen. First, he's de he has demons with him that he cannot control himself. He cannot do what he wants. Someone is controlling or wielding power over him. Number two, he's blind. And number three, he's mute. But when someone calls him, hey, come over. He can't hear or when someone um, waves at him, he can't see. When someone smiles at him, he can't see. 100% helpless, totally dependent on other people's charity and other people's help. And I thought at some point, you know, I, I am this person, right? The things I want to do, I cannot do, right? It was, um, there's this this power that sometimes wants to pull us 
and we are blind and sometimes we are we can't we can't see also it's a very very pitiful situation for any human being and guess what he was brought to god there were people around him who cared enough to take him to jesus and there's triple healing triple healing the demon was cast out the sight was given and the hearing was revived what is your reaction to this there would have been a celebration in the streets of wherever this is did the demon leave voluntarily <laughs> when he seen jesus i'm sorry did the demon leave voluntarily when he seen jesus I don't know. Can someone help me with that answer? Did the demon leave voluntarily? When he's saying Jesus coming. Well, I think uh, we can just go with what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is that uh, Cast out. he healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. So we just have to go with what the Bible says. So I think the demon didn't have any other choice but to leave. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Yep. So there was a celebration, you know, Warriors won, and there was celebration in the streets of Market Streets. And this person received so much grace, healing from the demon, blind, seeing Jesus, seeing people, seeing colors. Have you seen those YouTube videos when they were giving people um, the blind, color blind people when they were given that special glasses and families, everybody, they would like, oh, this is blue. Oh, this is green. Oh, this is red. This is orange. And they would just cry with happiness. Can you imagine a triple celebration like this? People at that point ask a very crucial question. Could this be? Could it be the son of David? Could the, this son of David be the Messiah? Could it be that the son of David is the Messiah? Sorry, I can't read. The crowd became more and more persuaded, not just following to see Jesus this time, this time, is to answer that question. Could this be the Messiah? When the Pharisee heard about it, um, they were more uh, angry. Did they applaud and celebrate it with the people? Besides, this man's life has been changed. It's now changed for good. This man can function and become a gainful, probably be able to work, um, and functioning citizen of, of the community. Did the Pharisees celebrate it? Not one word. Not one word. Before and even now. See, the Pharisees have hardened heart. And instead, their reaction is in verse 24. When the Pharisees heard about this, they said, it is only by Belzebul that the prince of demons, that this fellow, that this fellow drives out demons. Belzebul. Lord of the flies, this is and our slang word for, for Satan himself. In 2 Kings 126, um, it reads the, the power of, of Belzebul. I don't want to dwell so much on that. Just um, I want to keep looking at Jesus. But Jesus knew their thoughts. Jesus knew that, that this was what they're saying. And if I am in that, in the middle of that story, I can hear and I can see Jesus looking at their eyes and telling them the next verses. And Jesus said, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How, how can that? How then can he, this kingdom stand? 
defense number one. How can Satan drive out Satan? How can a household, uh, how can a household stand if both husband and wife are always fighting? If the people there are fighting, how can a nation stand if its citizen are fighting against each other? It will fall. It will surely fall. Defense number two, Jesus' defense number two. If I drive out demons by Belzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So you have your own exorcist. They do cast out demons. So if they cast out demons, how are they able to cast out demons using the power of God? And I'm casting out demons. I'm not using the power of God. You have double standards. The power of God, but if by the Spirit of God, I draw, but if by the Spirit of God that I drive out the demons, then the kingdom of God has upon you. The demons are cast out, go away, because the kingdom of God has come to drive out that demon. Defense number three, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first ties up the strong man and he can plunder his house? You can't steal someone's house if you're weaker than whoever is in that house. You have to be stronger or you must have something that is powerful to be able to tie him up. Um, so who is... It's power, strong versus stronger. Jesus is the strongest. In verse 29 is where um, Jesus draws the line. And he said, I love the absolutes of the Bible. Who is not against me? Who is not with me? is against me. If you are not with me, you are against me. Who does not gather is a scatterer. Jesus draws the line in the sand at this point and said, I rem I, I just remember what my boss said a long time ago. Uh, he said, Joan, if you're not growing, you're decaying. Just two things, right? Very simple. Desires of Ages says, in the great conflict of the soul of man, there is no middle ground if you're for me or against me. And then Jesus went on and discussed and talked about the unpardonable sin. I had to practice pronouncing that many times. The unpardonable sin. And this is where I want everyone to, to, to help me. The unpardonable sin is, as we know, is, is blasphemy. Why is it unpardonable sin? Am I saying it correctly? Unpardonable sin. Why is it unpardonable sin? Why is blasphemy unpardonable sin? Okay, help everyone. Well, that's the unpardonable sin. Why? Why is blasphemy an unpardonable sin? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> That's why we learn. <clears throat> I believe blasphemy is the unpardonable sin because it's the sin we refuse to let go of. We That's refuse to. So it's unpardonable. <clears throat> Notice that it says, blasphemy against the holy spirit so it's against the spirit um he says whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but whoever speaks against the holy spirit will not be forgiven so the unpardonable sin is something that is done against the holy spirit mm -hmm. and um i want to point you to john chapter 16 verse 14 
And um, this is Jesus. Uh, talking here and he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit here in the beginning of John chapter 16. But look what it says in verse 14. Um, actually, let me start at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, what, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So um, if we reject the Holy Spirit, there is no truth for us. The, whole, the Holy Spirit delivers truth to our minds. He takes what Jesus has accomplished and, and reveals it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit is our conduit um, to divinity, to God. If we reject the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that could be done for us. That's why it's unpardonable. It cannot be forgiven because we have cut off. We have cut ourselves off from connection with God via the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Livius. I, I, you know, I always watch Vespers on Friday in YouTube, and I always look forward to Livius' sharing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so yes, um, I, many, many years ago, I've been fascinated by the life of David. And, and he, he, this man who was destined to be a king, has made many, many sins big and small, and yet all his sins were forgiven. And he was even called the man after God's heart, even despite, right? All his sins were forgiven. But there's just this one sin that cannot be forgiven. It's like what Livia said, it's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It is the determination to know Jesus' teaching. I want to learn Jesus' teaching. I want to study. I want to study all his miracles and all his salvation and attribute all that to Satan. I, it is not God that blinds the eyes of men or hardens their heart. He sends us light. He sends men light to correct our errors and to lead our path to safe place, to safe path. It is by the rejection of this light that the eyes are blinded and the eyes are hardened. You know, I wanted to take this time because um, and ask everyone, anyone here who remembers what we read every Saturday morning during Sabbath, the greatest fear is the fear of, anyone? We read this before a church service, anyone? What was your fear? Right, we forget the fear of forgetting, right? This one is rejection. Um, so my question is, does God not want to forgive uh, blasphemy uh, or, or, or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Does God essentially does not want to want to forgive? The answer is nay. No, 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 not because God does not want to forgive. But the person who commits this unpardonable sin has no desire to ask for forgiveness remember he gave his one his only son so that we can all be with him how can he not want to forgive he wants to forgive but the action needs to come from the sinner acknowledge that sin
and if you don't uh, want to ask don't commit the sin yeah so you, well how can you be forgiven when you don't admit to that you are a sinner right how can you ask for forgiveness when you don't know you're wrong how can i say sorry when i don't know what i'm sorry for right and so and so it's not that god does not not want to forgive he does but he you, the action needs to come from us first to realize that we are a sinner besides he gave his one and only son so that we can spend the rest of forever with him that ends my uh talk study today thank you so much question if you have questions please ask adventist pastor at gmail <laughs> <laughs> good one john good one <laughs> any inputs reaction violent reaction addition subtraction Pastor Mark, I'm giving it back to you. All right. Thank you so much. I, uh, I think this was kind of a difficult miracle because it's not just a miracle. It is a lot of what's happening around the miracle. I think you did a great job bringing out a lot of these points. I think one of the things to never forget about the unpardonable sin is found in verse 31. So John, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31 it says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. So that tells us it's a guarantee that every sin, every blasphemy that anybody could ever commit can be forgiven, except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which implies and leads us to believe that the Holy Spirit is the one that is involved with getting us to ask forgiveness. So if I say, let's just imagine the Holy Spirit is that uh, God-given uh, blessing that convicts me. Mark, you need to ask forgiveness. Mark, you need to ask forgiveness. And I say, no, 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 no. Then I'm not going to be forgiven because if Matthew 12, 31 is correct, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. Then the, bla then the sin that will not be forgiven is the sin that I don't confess. And uh, I think it's important to note here that Jesus says that every sin, uh, if a person speaks a word against, the, uh, against Jesus, that can be forgiven, but not against the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is looking forward to the day when the Holy Spirit is going to be God's agency here on this earth until the second coming that is going to lead us to repentance and lead us to ask forgiveness. Yeah, he's God, uh, too. He sure is. Uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting that I, uh, that I noticed here, John, I thank you for putting this out. But uh, before I go to that, because it's another topic, uh, anybody else, anything you've learned from the Bible study tonight? Or anything you want to share? Um, I have a question. Um, what's the Holy Spirit and what's the blasphemy? It's not the Holy Spirit is God and it's not the same? It's a good question. Thank you, Alice. So the Holy Spirit is, we could say, the proper name for a person. The person is the Holy Spirit. Another person is Jesus Christ. And another person that we generally refer to as God the Father. Now, these three persons are all divine, just like you have hundreds of thousands of angels and millions and billions of humans. There's only three in this category of divine, and that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you're correct. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is fully divine, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now, God, though, is plural, meaning that there's more than one person in the Godhead. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three together are God, and each one individually are God, and they're divine as well. Yes. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank good, you. Good, good, good.
one thing that I thought was kind of neat, and I, and I hadn't noticed this before until Joan brought it, pointed it out, but Jesus was essentially defending his actions. And he actually said something that was so encouraging. And I just want to point this out. I'm not going to try to, I'm going to try not to make this be a whole Bible study, uh, you know, because this is Joan's Bible study tonight. This is not mine. But uh, check out verse uh, 30. Check out verse 29. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? It's kind of weird. And sometimes we don't really focus on this verse, but this verse I think is so inspiring. This past week, Patricia and I were uh, listening to and talking about um, a uh, kind of a parable that C.S. Lewis put together. And in this parable, somebody needs to come in and release the captives. Someone needs to come in and release the captives that are held by the uh, forces of darkness, the forces of evil. And there's no one strong enough to release these captives. And so when you think about it, that's kind of the way it is on this earth. When Je before Jesus came to this earth, Satan was the strongest power on this earth, except for God. Okay. So Satan had absolute, you know, un, un, uh, unopposed power, you could say. And Jesus comes and Jesus starts releasing captives. It would be like, let's say that there's a large castle or fortress that is heavily guarded and no one can get into this fortress and release the captives until one day just imagine in your mind a very strong powerful individual goes and this person is able to get past the guards get into the castle get into the dungeons and start releasing the chains that are on the captives i mean get this picture in your mind here when jesus here says in verse 29 or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? What Jesus here is saying is, you don't understand Pharisees, you don't understand religious leaders, but there's somebody here that is stronger than Satan. None of you can claim that. None of you have ever heard of this before. None of you have ever seen anybody in real flesh and blood that is stronger than Satan. And what you have just witnessed is somebody is stronger than Satan. And it's like, if you're going to come in and plunder the, the strong man's house, and just imagine the strong man is Satan, and plundering his house is stealing back the captives that ca Satan has gotten control over, that he is holding uh, hostage, that he is holding captive. It's Jesus who's going in, and he says, I'm able to bind the strong man and then I'm able to plunder his house. You see, what Jesus has just done is he has just done this amazing miracle for a demon-possessed person. And everybody there should have been in absolute awe and then broken out in rapturous hallelujah because finally a deliverer has come who's stronger than Satan. And what do we find? The religious leaders are saying, oh, he's just doing that by the power of Satan. And what you will find is that Jesus's words back to them are so strong because what they're doing is they are essentially, they're essentially ruining the whole miracle and the whole emphasis. I mean, it happens sometimes to me as a pastor where I'll be getting to a point where I'm just about ready to, I'm just about ready to, you know, bring in my zinger of a object lesson or my illustration. And then somebody will speak up and they will say something and you're like, ah, oh, you stole my thunder. <laughs> well, that's really what's happening in this story is the religious leaders have completely stolen Jesus's thunder. He, they've stolen Jesus's power. They've stolen the conviction of the moment where people are in awe and saying, wow, this is amazing. And then the religious leaders are saying, oh, it's just by Satan. He's just, he's just, he's in cahoots with Satan. And Jesus says, don't you realize the thing that the planet has been longing for, what has been predicted for hundreds of years, 
what every human has been longing for is released from Satan, the strong man. There's somebody here that's stronger than the strong man. And I just like what Jesus says here in verse 29. How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man? This implies that there's somebody there that's stronger than the strong man. There's somebody that's there that's more powerful than the strong man. The strong man is Satan. So Jesus here is essentially saying, I've shown up and I'm stronger than the strong man. And I'm here to plunder his goods. I'm here to bring back captives. I'm here to release those people that he claims as his. And I just see verse 29 as such a, uh, a beautiful illustration about the work that Jesus Christ has come to do. And then Jesus says, listen, if you're not with me, you're against me. He essentially says there's only two positions. There's only two grounds. He doesn't say you're with me, you're neutral, and you're, or you're against me. He doesn't say you're with me or you could care less, or you're against me. No, he says there's just two grounds. You're either with me, or you're fighting against me. And what this does is it clearly shows the Pharisees and the religious leaders that, hey, you either need to get on board, or you're on the side of the strong man. Uh, But anyway, I just want to point that out. And I just noticed that as we were talking tonight, and I want to thank John for pointing that out. Anybody else have any comments, questions, thoughts before we go to our closing song tonight? And by the way, if you have any prayer requests, please put them in our chat because uh, Esther is going to be having our closing prayer pretty soon and she would love to pray over those prayer requests. One small point. If you go back to 28, I think it's interesting. That's the only place... In the New Testament, I, I think this this has been set out right. Jesus is always kind of partially not information, but he says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, I think all of his acts are the Spirit of God. Like John said, the Holy Spirit came and remained, and that's why he was praying all the time. He was reaffirming and restoring himself, and he was, you know, pure and blameless and always focused, and he always, they worked together the three, right? God was reconciling everybody, and this is kind of how he started, and he, and and I think the Holy Spirit works through us, and then we don't hold on to it, we spread, you know, we we hopefully let it out and, and to help, as in the same way Jesus did, but, you know, a little, a little, uh, less, uh, a little less power and emphasis, but it seems to me it's the same process and that's the first time i remember seeing that and that's this tonight was the first time i it really uh, 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 appealed to me that way so that's it it's good i like that that's really good All right. Well, I want to thank Joan again. And uh, it's kind of exciting, all the things we're able to pull out of just a miracle, isn't it? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the time over to Veronica, and she's going to introduce our closing song for tonight. All right, Veronica. Okay. So our closing song for tonight, it's titled, He is Exalted. So the music is going to be an instrumental one, so you guys won't see the lyrics. Uh, but I will put them on the chat, the first two verses, and they pretty much repeat. So if you guys want to sing along, um, you can sing along. But um, what the song says is that uh, the king is exalted, is exalted on high, and I will praise him. Um, the king, He's exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise his name. So I'll copy right now. And Pastor Mark, if you can share the song, please. All right, thank you. I'm going to just uh, mute everybody and I will go ahead and play that song at this time. Let's see here if I can figure out how to do this.
Great song. He is exalted. Okay, Esther is going to have our closing prayer. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, if you can all bow your heads with me, and we will pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, for guiding us to the end of the week and for this time that we've had to study your word together. We thank you, Lord, for just the reminder that you have all power and authority um, over all things and that you have um, created this world and created us with just the word of your mouth and um and that you, although that you are a, a mighty and powerful God, you know and care for each one of us, and you even know the hairs on our heads. Um, we thank you so much for Jesus and his life um, on earth, and just the powerful example he um, is to us, and an example of how we should live our lives. Um, we want to surrender our hearts to you, and we ask that you would um, give us hearts of flesh and that you would turn our stony hearts into hearts that you can mold and make. Um, and we pray that you would help us not to harden our hearts, but that we would just um, allow you to work within our hearts. And we pray for the Holy Spirit um, in greater measure in our lives, that um, your Holy Spirit would use us, convict us, and empower us so that we can live um, lives that would bring you glory and honor. I want to pray for the prayer requests that were mentioned. I want to pray for um, Ina's prayer request for Max's upcoming surgery. We ask that you would uh, give him peace in his heart, that you would be with um, the surgeon who's going to be performing the surgery and all the medical staff, um, that you give them wisdom, that you would um, be with the surgery. Also want to pray for all of those people who have COVID right now. Um, want to ask that your healing hand will be upon them and that um, during this difficult time, Lord, that you would give them strength and peace in their heart. We thank you um, so much for the Sabbath, and I pray that you would help us to um, commune with you um, during these Sabbath hours. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much. Again, thank you to Joan for uh, our Bible study tonight, but not just Joan. Thank you to Mike for leading out in our discussion, uh, Veronica for leading out in our music, for Esther for leading out in our prayer time, for Ina for our prayer time as well. It's awesome to be a part of this team. So go and have a good sleep and look forward to seeing you tomorrow at church. Good night. We don't Bye. want a good sleep. You don't we want a good sleep? Uh, you've been sleeping all day. Are you off quarantine yet? <laughs> What's that? Are you off quarantine yet? Yes. Oh, good. They want to keep me in the bedroom for another five days. Oh, but I sneak must be, out some yeah, yeah, Yes. You must be going <laughs> crazy, John. I'm sorry. No, I snuck out a few times. Oh, no. oh yeah? Are you wearing a mask? But since I'm by myself. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I got to protect, I got to protect other people. That's right. We'll go out in the backyard and sit in the, go and sit in the garden. You're not going to hurt the trees, and it's good to be out in nature. Yeah. What happened to Ana? Uh, I don't know. I think everything's okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, good night, John. I hope you have a good sleep tonight, even though you've slept all day. <laughs>